On tonight's show, eroticism or pornography, a fine line between the two. Tonight, Audre Lorde and Adrian Rich will discuss how the images of eroticism and pornography affect women. Their talks were originally given at the first national conference on feminist perspectives on pornography. But first, let's try to define the two. According to Funk and Wagnall's New Standard Dictionary of the English Language, porn or porno comes from the Greek word for prostitution, to sell as captives. And pornography is defined as the description of prostitutes and of prostitution, or the expression or suggestion of the obscene in speaking, writing, etc. Erotic is defined as pertaining to passionate love or sexual desire, suggested by or treating of love, a theory or science of love. In the November issue of Ms. Magazine, Gloria Steinem wrote an article entitled Erotica and Pornography, A Clear Present Difference. The following is an excerpt from that article. Sexuality can be, and often is, primarily a way of bonding, of giving and receiving pleasure, bridging differentness, discovering sameness, and communicating emotion. Erotica and pornography can be so crucially different and yet so confused, both assume that sexuality can be separated from conception and therefore can be used to carry a personal message. That's a major reason why, even in our current culture, both may be called equally shocking or legally obscene, a word whose Latin derivative means dirty, containing filth. This gross condemnation of all sexuality that isn't harnessed to childbirth and marriage has been increased by the current backlash against women's progress. Out of that fear that the whole patriarchal structure might be upset if women really had the autonomous power to decide our reproductive futures, that is, if we controlled the most basic means of production, right-wing groups are not only denouncing pro-choice abortion literature as pornographic, but are trying to stop the sending of all contraceptive information through the mails by invoking obscenity laws. In fact, Phyllis Schlafly recently denounced the entire women's movement as obscene. Erotica is rooted in eros, or passionate love, and thus in the idea of positive choice, free will, the yearning for a particular person. Interestingly, the definition of erotica leaves open the question of gender. Pornography begins with a root meaning prostitution, or female captives, thus letting us know that the subject is not mutual love, or love at all, but domination and violence against women. It ends with a root meaning writing about or description of which puts still more distance between subject and object and replaces a spontaneous yearning for closeness with objectification and a voyeur. Look at any photo or film of people making love, really making love. The images may be diverse, but there is usually a sensuality and touch and warmth and acceptance of bodies and nerve endings. There is always a spontaneous sense of people who are there because they want to be, out of shared pleasure. Now look at any depiction of sex in which there is clear force or an unequal power that spells coercion. It may be very blatant with weapons of torture or bondage, wounds and bruises, some clear humiliation or an adult sexual power being used over a child. It may be much more subtle, a physical attitude of conqueror and victim, the use of race or class difference to imply the same thing. In either case, there is no sense of equal choice or equal power. The first is erotic, a mutually pleasurable sexual expression between people who have enough power to be there by positive choice. The second is pornographic. Its message is violence, dominance, and conquest. It is sex being used to reinforce some inequality, or to create one, or to tell us the lie that pain and humiliation, ours or someone else's, are really the same as pleasure. If we are to feel anything, we must identify with conqueror or victim. Consider also our spirits that break a little each time we see ourselves in chains, or full labial display for the conquering male viewer, bruised or on our knees, screaming a real or pretended pain to delight the saddest, pretending to enjoy what we don't enjoy, to be blind to the images of our sisters that really haunt us, humiliated often enough ourselves by the truly obscene idea that sex and the domination of women must be combined. Sexuality is human, free, separate, and so are we. But until we untangle the lethal confusion of sex with violence, there will be more pornography and less erotica, 
there will be little murders in our beds and very little love. Audre Lorde is a native New Yorker. Her seventh book of poetry, The Black Unicorn, was just released by Harper and Rowe. She thinks of her verse as the poems of a black warrior woman poet doing her work. Her paper on female eroticism was presented at the first national conference on feminist perspectives on pornography. What I wanted to speak to today is another aspect or the opposite of the pornographic because it's really hard. I know it is for me and I'm sure it is for you. Andrea Dworkin yesterday spoke about the necessity of our knowing our enemy. Well, in order to know our enemy, we have to expose ourselves to some really energy sapping things. And to do that, we need all the strength we can get. We need each one of us to deal from a place where we are most powerful. And what I wanted to talk about today was the erotic as a source of that power and how urgent it is that we recognize that within ourselves and that we not confuse the pornographic with the erotic. The name of this is uses of the erotic, the erotic is power. Now there are many kinds of power both the ones we use and the ones we do not yet use, acknowledged and otherwise. The erotic is a resource within each one of us that lies in a very deeply female and spiritual plane. It is firmly rooted in the power of all our unexpressed and unrecognized feelings. In order to perpetrate itself, every oppression in our history must corrupt or distort those various sources of power within the culture of the oppressed, as for instance, within our culture as women, that can provide energy for change. Now for women, this has meant the suppression of the erotic as a considered source of our power and information within our lives. We have been taught to suspect this resource. It has been vilified, abused, and devalued within Western society. On one hand, the superficially erotic has been encouraged as a sign of our inferiority. On the other hand, women have been made to suffer and to feel contemptible and suspect by virtue of its existence. So actually, it's a very short step from there to the very false belief that it is only by the suppression of the erotic within our lives and our consciousness that women can be truly strong. But that kind of strength is illusory. It is not real because it is fashioned within the context of a male model of power. As women, we have often come to distrust that power which rises from our deepest and non-rational knowledge because of course we have been warned against it all our lives by a male world which values this depth of feeling enough to keep women around in order to exercise it in their service, but with fears this same depth too much to examine the possibilities of it within themselves. So in this case, women are maintained at a distant and inferior position, psychically milked, much the same way that ants maintain colonies of aphids to provide a life-giving substance for the masters. But the erotic, offers a well of replenishing and provocative force to any woman who does not fear its revelation, nor succumb to the belief that sensation is enough. The erotic has been misnamed and used against us. It has been made into the confused, the trivial, the psychotic, the pornographic, the plasticized sensation, and for this reason, we have often turned away from the exploration and consideration of the erotic as a source of power and information. We have confused it with the opposite, the pornographic. But pornography is a direct denial of the power of the erotic, for it represents the suppression of all true feeling. Pornography emphasizes sensation without feeling, and the erotic is a measure between the beginnings of our sense of self and the chaos and power of our deepest feelings. It is an internal sense of satisfaction to which once we have experienced it, we know we can aspire. 
Once having experienced the fullness of this depth of feeling and recognized its power, in honor and self-respect, we can require no less of ourselves. Now, it is never easy to demand the most from ourselves, from our lives, from our work. To go beyond the encouraged mediocrity of the society that we live in is always fraught with danger and with fear. And the function of the erotic is to encourage excellence. The function of the erotic is to encourage excellence and to give us the strength to pursue it. But giving in to the fear of feeling and working to capacity is a luxury that only the unintentional can afford. And by the unintentional, I mean those who, are, who do not wish to guide their own destinies. And I do not think that that, I hope, that does not speak to anyone here now. This internal requirement toward excellence, which we learn from the erotic, must not be misconstrued as demanding the impossible, either from ourselves or from others, because such a demand incapacitates everyone in the process. For the erotic is not a question of what we do alone. It is a question of how acutely, how fully we can feel in the doing. For once we know the extent to which we are capable of feeling that sense of satisfaction, that sense of fullness, that sense of completion, we can then observe which of our various life endeavors bring us closest to that fullness. The aim of each thing which we do is to make our lives and the lives of our children more possible and more rich. Within the celebration of the erotic in all our endeavors, my work for me becomes a conscious decision, a longed for bed which I enter gratefully and from which I rise up empowered. Of course, any woman so empowered is dangerous and we are taught to separate that erotic demand from most vital areas of our lives other than sex. And the lack of concern for the erotic root and satisfaction of our work is felt in our disaffection from so much of what we do. For instance, how many of us and how often do we really love our work? The principal horror of any system which defines the good in terms of profit rather than in terms of human need, or which defines human need to the exclusion of the psychic and emotional components of that need, the principal horror of any such system is that it robs our work of its erotic value, its erotic power, its erotic life appeal and fulfillment. Such a system reduces work to a travesty of necessities, a duty by which we earn bread or oblivion for ourselves and those we love. And this is tantamount to blinding a painter and then telling her to improve her work, to enjoy the act of painting. It is not only next to impossible, it is also profoundly cruel. As women, we need to examine the ways in which our world can be truly different. I am speaking here of the necessity for reassessing the very quality of all the aspects of our lives and of our work. The very word erotic comes from the Greek word eros, the personification of love in all its aspects born of chaos, and personifying creative power and harmony. When I speak of the erotic, then, I speak of it as an assertion of the life force of all women, of that creative energy empowered, the knowledge and use of which we are now reclaiming in our language, our history, our dancing, our loving, our work, our lives. There have been frequent attempts to equate pornography and eroticism, the two diametrically opposed uses of the sexual. And because of these attempts, it has become fashionable to separate the spiritual, the psychic and emotional, away from the political, to see them as contradictory or antithetical. 
For instance, what do you mean a poetic revolutionary, a meditating gun runner? Well, they exist. They exist in this room. In the same way, we have attempted to separate the spiritual and the erotic, reducing the spiritual thereby to a world of a flattened affect, of, of, of vague mystery, a world of the ascetic who aspires to feeling nothing. But nothing is farther from the truth. The severe abstinence of the aesthetic, ascetic becomes the ruling obsession, and it is one not of self-discipline, but of self-abnegation. So the dichotomy between the spiritual and the political is false, resulting from an incomplete attention to our erotic knowledge. The bridge which connects the spiritual and the political is formed by the erotic, the sensual, those physical, emotional, psychic expressions of what is deepest and strongest and richest within each one of us being shared the passions of love in its deepest meanings. The considerate phrase, it feels right to me, acknowledges the strength of the erotic into a true knowledge. For what that phrase means and feels is the first and most powerful guiding light toward any understanding. And I ask that you remember always, understanding is a handmaiden a handmaiden which can only wait upon or clarify that knowledge deeply born. And the erotic is the nurturer or nursemaid of our deepest knowledge. The erotic functions for me in several ways. The first is in the power which comes from sharing deeply any pursuit with another person. The sharing of joy, whether physical, emotional, psychic, or intellectual, forms a bridge between the sharers, which can be the basis for understanding much of what is not shared between us. And it lessens the threat of difference, that difference which is always seems so insurmountable, as for instance, we have just seen. Another important way in which the erotic connection functions for me is the open and fearless underlining of my capacity for joy. In the way that my body stretches to music, opens into response, hearkening to its deepest rhythms, so every level upon which I sense also opens to the erotically satisfying experience, whether it is dancing, building a bookcase, writing a poem, making love, examining an idea. That self-connection shared is a measure of the joy which I know myself capable of feeling, a reminder of my capacity for that feeling. And that deep and irreplaceable knowledge of my capacity for joy comes to demand from all my life that it be lived within the knowledge that such satisfaction is possible and does not have to be called marriage, nor God, nor a man, nor an afterlife. This is one reason why the erotic is so feared in the society that we live in, and so often relegated to the bedroom alone where it is recognized or when it is recognized at all. For once we begin to feel deeply all the aspects of our lives, we begin to demand from ourselves and from all our lives' pursuits, that they feel in accordance with that joy which we know ourselves to be capable of. In other words, our erotic knowledge empowers us, becomes a lens through which we scrutinize all aspects of our existence, forcing ourselves to evaluate those aspects honestly in terms of their relative meanings within our lives, in terms of their erotic value. And this is a grave responsibility. It's projected from within each one of us, not to settle, not to settle for what is convenient or shoddy, for the conventionally expected, nor what is nearly safe. Some of you here perhaps are too young to remember, some of you are not, but during World War II, we would buy 
sealed plastic packets of white uncolored margarine with a tiny little intense pellet of yellow coloring perched like a topaz just inside the clear skin of the bag we would leave the margarine out for a while to soften and then we would pinch the little pellet breaking it inside the bag releasing that rich yellowness into the soft pale mass of the margarine then taking it very carefully in our hands we would knead it very gently back and forth over and over until the color had spread throughout the whole pound of margarine leaving it thoroughly colored i find the erotic such a kernel within myself. <laughs> when released from its intense and constrained pellet, it flows through and colors my life with a kind of energy that heightens and sensitizes and strengthens all my experience. We have been raised to fear the yes in ourselves, our deepest cravings. For the demands of our released expectations lead us inevitably into actions which will help bring our lives into accordance with our needs, with our knowledge, with our desires. And the fear of our deepest cravings will always keep them suspect and will also keep us docile and loyal and obedient and lead us to settle for or to accept so many facets of our oppression as women. When we live outside ourselves, and by that I mean on the external directives only, on what is expected of us, rather than from our internal knowledge and needs, when we live away from those erotic guides from within ourselves, then our lives are limited by external and alien forms and we conform to the needs of a structure that is not based on human needs, let alone any individuals. But when we begin to live from within outward, when we begin to live first from that deepest place and then out through the extensions of ourselves into the lives that we inhabit, in touch with the power of the erotic within ourselves and allowing that power to inform and to illuminate our actions upon the world around us, then we begin to be responsible to ourselves in the deepest sense. For as we begin to recognize our deepest feelings, we begin to give up of necessity being satisfied with suffering or being satisfied with self-abnegation or with self-negation and with the numbness which so often seems like their only alternative in this society. We empower ourselves to action. Our acts of, against oppression then become integral within ourself, becomes part of ourselves, motivated and empowered from within. In touch with the erotic, I become less willing to accept powerlessness or those other supplied states of being which are not native to me, such as resignation, despair, self-effacement, depression, self-denial. And yes, there is a hierarchy. There is a difference between painting the back fence and writing a poem, but only one of quantity. And there is, for me, no difference between writing a good poem and moving into sunlight against the body of a woman I love. And this brings me to the last consideration of the erotic for the time being. <laughs> to share the power of each other's feelings is different from using another's feeling as we would use a Kleenex. And when we look the other way from our experience, erotic or otherwise, we use rather than share the feelings of those others who participate in that experience with us. And use without consent of the used is abuse. In order to be utilized, our erotic feelings must be recognized. The need for sharing deep feeling is a human need. But within the European-American tradition, 
that need is satisfied by certain prescribed erotic comings together. And these occasions are almost always characterized by a simultaneous looking away, a pretense of calling them something else, whether religion, a fit, mob violence, or even playing doctor. And this misnaming of the need and the deed gives rise to that distortion which results in pornography and obscenity, the abuse of feeling. When we look away from the importance of the erotic in the development and the sustenance of our power, or when we look away from ourselves as we satisfy our erotic needs in concert with each other, and I submit to you that this conference has been erotic for me and for many of us, I hope, because it has come very close to very deep feelings and will result, as we have seen, in genuine action. When we look away from ourselves, as we satisfy our erotic needs in concert with each other, we use each other as objects of satisfaction rather than sharing our joy in the satisfying, rather than making connection with our similarities and our differences. To refuse to be conscious of what we are feeling at any time, however comfortable that might seem, is to deny a large part of the experience and to allow ourselves to be reduced to the pornographic, to the abused, and to the absurd. Now, the erotic cannot be felt secondhand. As a black lesbian feminist, I have a particular feeling, knowledge, and understanding for those sisters with whom I have danced hard, worked hard, played hard, or even fought. This deep participation has often been the forerunner for joint concerted action not possible before. And that is what we are about here, isn't it? For this erotic charge is not easily shared by women who continue to operate under an exclusively European-American male tradition. I know it was not available to me when I was trying to adapt my consciousness to that mode of living and sensation. Only now I find more and more women-identified women brave enough to risk sharing the erotic's electrical charge without having to look away, without distorting the enormously powerful and creative nature of that exchange. Recognizing the power of the erotic within our lives can give us the energy to pursue genuine change within our world, rather than merely settling for a shift of characters within the same weary drama. For not only do we touch our most profoundly creative source, but we do that which is female, that which is self-affirming in the face of a racist, patriarchal, and anti-erotic society. I would like us to keep in touch with those deepest feelings that we have, and perhaps it will help us bridge some of the very real differences and some of the very real ways in which we see our course separately. Thank you. Adrienne Rich is a feminist poet who lives in New York City. Her books of poetry include poems selected in New 1950 through 1974, Diving into the Wreck, for which she was co-winner of the 1974 National Book Award, The Will to Change, 21 Love Poems, and The Dream of a Common Language. She is the author of a feminist prose study of motherhood, of woman born, and has written numerous articles and papers on emerging feminist issues and concerns. I was thinking of the fact that bombarded as we are by the images of violence against women, we have so few images of our own as yet to counteract them. And what we have to be about is not simply destroying those images, but creating the ones which must replace them. And I think I really began to understand this fully uh, about three years ago when I was on the island of Crete, where I saw in the museums and in the ruins numberless images of 
female divinity and a female power and female strength. And I began to have a sense of what it could have been like to live in a culture where women were seen as powerful and where women were seen as sacred. Out of that experience, some of, some of this poem comes. It's called The Images. Close to your body, in the pain of a city, I turn. My hand, half sleeping, reaches, finds some part of you. Touch knows you before language names in the brain. Out in the dark, a howl, police sirens, emergency, our 3 a.m. familiar, ripping the sheath of sleep, registering pure force, as if all transpired, the swell of cruelty and helplessness in one block between West End and Riverside. In my dreams, the Hudson rules the night like a right-hand margin, drawn against the updraft of burning light, the tongueless cries of the city. I turn again, slip my arm under the pillow, turned for relief. Your breathing traces my shoulder. Two women sleeping together have more than their sleep to defend. And what can reconcile me that you, the woman whose hand, sensual and protective, brushes me in sleep, go down each morning into such a city? I will not, cannot withhold your body or my own from its chosen danger. But when did we ever choose to see our bodies strung in bondage and crucifixion across the exhausted air? When did we choose to be lynched on the queasy electric signs of Midtown? When did we choose to become the masturbator's fix, emblem of rape in Riverside Park, the campground at Big Sur, the beach at Sydney. We are trying to live in a clear-headed tenderness. I speak not merely of us. Our lives are moral and ordinary as the lives of numberless women. I pretend the Hudson is a right-hand margin drawn against violence and woman loathing, water as purification, river as boundary, but I know my imagination lies. In the name of freedom of speech, they are lynching us. No law is on our side. There are no boundaries. No man's land does not exist. I can never romanticize language again, never deny its power for disguise, for mystification. But the same could be said for music or any form created. Painted ceilings, beaten gold, worm-worn pietas, reorganizing victimization, frescoes translating violence into patterns so powerful and pure, we continually fail to ask, are they true for us? When I walked among time-battered stones, thinking already of you. When I sat near the sea among parched yet flowering weeds, when I drew in my notebook the thorned, purple-tongued flower, each petal protected by its thorn leaf, I was mute, innocent of grammar as the waves irrhythmically washing. I felt washed clean of the guilt of words there was no word to read in the book of that earth, no perjury, the Tower of Babel fallen once and for all. Light drank at my body. Thinking of you, I felt free in the cicada's pulse, their encircling praise. When I saw her face, she of the several faces, staring, indrawn, in judgment, laughing for joy, her serpents twisting, her arms raised, her breasts gazing. When I looked into her world, 
I wished to cry loose my soul into her, to become free of speech at last. And a woman said to me, I have made images like those. I was ashamed of them. My master sneered at them. I tore them into shreds. I threw them away. And so I came home, a woman starving for images, to say my hunger is so deep, so ancient, that all the lost, crumbled, burnt, smashed, shattered, defaced, overpainted, concealed and falsely named faces of every past we have shared together in all the ages could rise, reassemble, recollect, remember themselves as I remembered myself in that presence, as every night close to your body in the pain of the city turning, I am remembered by you, remember you, even as we are dismembered on the blue movie screens, the white expensive walls of collectors, the news rags blowing the streets, and it would not be enough. This is the war of the images. We are the thorn leaf guarding the purple-tongued flower, each to each.